Next up in Authors and Innovators, I'm delighted that Will Herman is with us. Will is a, uh, in addition to being an author, he's an entrepreneur, active angel investor, uh, corporate director, and startup mentor for countless companies. He started and managed five companies, resulting in two IPOs, uh, a number of corporate, uh, two corporate sales. Uh, he's also invested in over 80 startups and sat on the boards of more than 25 and advised hundreds more. Uh, he's also the author, co-author of The Startup Playbook. Uh, with Raj Bagarva, a dear friend of his, who's an MIT grad with over two decades of tech experience. Will, welcome. I'm so pleased you're here. This is just a, I've written about uh, this book. I use it in my class at BC Law School. It's a terrific, uh, ter terrific book that I hope all of our attendees uh, will have the, the, uh, the chance to get. Let's talk a bit about it. Our theme for authors and innovators is change makers. And so what better change, um, or what better way to change than to start with yourself? You start the book, uh, Will, by encouraging introspection. Is a startup the right thing for you to do? Because it's not for everyone. How would you answer folks who say, do I need this book? Do I really want to start something up? Um, what would you say to them? Well, first, Larry, thanks so much for having me and your many kind words. Um, hopefully some of them are deserved. We'll, we'll <laughs> see, see about that. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the Hollywood version of entrepreneurship and startups has, has romanticized what it means to be an entrepreneur, to start a company. Um, and it's, it's greatly false. I mean, first of all, we all know about nine out of every 10 startups fail. Um, and so it's highly likely, no matter how smart you are, no matter how ready you think you are, no matter how much money you have, you're likely to fail. Um, and I, it's really important to understand that up front, not because it's a negative. I mean, uh, the fact is I've done, I, you know, I've done five myself. I've been involved with hundreds more and failures just happen. And if you're a person who gets emotionally tied and really, really fundamentally involved, and you can't deal with that, that can be a real heartbreaker. I mean, that that can really upset you. If you're a person who can go with the flow and loves change and and loves taking risks and 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 seeing, you know, the output of of all of their efforts, regardless of success or failure, um, then it's a reasonable thing to to um, to give try, give a try. Um, but you know, if you're out there to make money, if you're trying to make money by doing a startup or get fame or something like that, you'd probably be better off working for a large company somewhere. <laughs> well, it's blunt and uh, direct as, as is most of the advice in this terrific book. Well, how do you know if an idea has legs, Will? What do you and Raj tell folks? How do you know if it's a good idea or not? Yeah, well, we, we spent a lot of time on this in the book. We, Raj and I um, basically believe that ideas are just not important. And, and um, I, they're important to the extent that if your, your idea is to do the same thing that 500 companies before you have done, <laughs> right. you know, that's, that's a problem. That's, you know, then it's going to be, then it's going to really impact your ability to be successful. But you know, we would take a good team of with solid execution with a poor idea that is one that's been done before or really doesn't stand on its own before we take a good idea with a poor team with with mediocre execution. Um, it's not the idea that makes successful startups. It's it's the execution of an idea that makes a successful startup. So if someone's going to talk to you, Araj, you're saying it's the person. Uh, you're trying to make an assessment about whether that person is has got the it factor to be an entrepreneur. How do they figure out pricing and markets? What's the shorthand in your head, Will, if you say, look, I can determine, um, and having talked to you and having read the book, um, I can pretty much determine where this is going to go in about five minutes. What, what do they say in that five minutes to get someone like you who's an experienced advisor, investor, entrepreneur, to set, to lean in and say, oh, tell me more. What are the kind of things that you look for in, a, um, in that first five to 10 minutes? Yeah, so uh, there's, there's no panacea here. There's, there, and, there, and there's no one 
one indication. Um, even a successful entrepreneur doesn't mean, a previously successful entrepreneur doesn't mean that they're going to create a new success. The odds are better, but it's not a slam dunk by any means. We look at things as a series of, of, uh, uh, of indications that that are either positive or negatives and we think that every there are red flags in every every startup in every team and um and if there are a certain number of red flags then it can get bad i mean everyone's got some do they I, have too many and what and, are they well so so <laughs> there there's an infinite number but the key ones are um you know uh, does the entrepreneur listen to advice? They never have to take the advice, but do they listen to the advice and do they put it as part of their calculus in their company? Um, often there's a resistance to external advice, which is virtually always a death knell. Um, there is uh, the single entrepreneur who thinks that, uh, who has trouble for a variety of reasons, building a uh, startup team, a team of founders, to execute on their idea or their plan. And uh, anybody who's stubborn about doing it themselves versus building a team, almost always a problem. Um, there are people who want to go for capital first. It's uh, We say in the chapter in our book about um, about whether you're cut out to be an entrepreneur or not is, yeah, we know you're skipping this chapter to go right to how to get funded chapter, the how to get funded chapter. <laughs> Um, it is important. Um, it is, in fact, critical along the way, but it is not the most important thing you have to do. Um, so, so there's a lot in there. You talked about you want to make sure that somebody's a good listener, and you measure that by trying to figure out who their advisors are. You're concerned about anybody who's just going to be a solo founder. And you're concerned about folks who put the money piece first. Talk about some of that, because you see business plans from all kinds of people in your inbox and they're listing, Hey, I've got Will Herman as an advisor. Um, how do you figure that out in that first five or 10 minutes that even though Will might be listed, he's not terribly active. Um, and do you have a view on board of advisors versus board of directors? How, what would you tell, what would you tell an entrepreneur who's trying to say, well, I I'm hearing Will, I want to emphasize that I listen and I want to emphasize that I've thought about the business before the dollars, how do they do that for you? Yeah, so I think I think that's uh, that's a super that's a super good question. Um, uh, the if if somebody says, "Oh, I have X Y Z as an advisor on," you know, uh, well, let's not even put it as an advisory board kind of thing. Um, I'd say, what have you learned from them? Ah. And it's just as simple as that. And mm -hmm. and I don't have to know the person to know that uh, they're, uh, what they've learned is being reported. Oh, yeah, well, I learned my original idea was not going to attract customers because X, Y, or Z. Okay, that's a good piece of feedback. Um, if they really have that person on their uh, uh, as part of their team, then... Um, and they're using it as a marketing ploy to get more to get money. You know, they've attracted someone to put a name on a piece of paper on a in a PowerPoint presentation. Right. That's right. easy to call out pretty pretty quickly. And a lot of that a lot of that happens. And um, and one of the things that when you ask about um, structure, how have you raised money? How much have you raised? What are the kind of things that you like to hear? from an entrepreneur? Do you like to hear that they have bootstrapped it? Do you like to hear that they've raised a certain amount of money to attract um, someone to validate their idea? What, what are the kind of things that are good and not so good when you ask, how have you funded this so far? So um, I, I don't know that there's any absolutes there, but because uh, it depends, there's a lot of variables and depends on the situation. But I, I want to know how much you know, if they say, oh, my uh, my grandmother and my uncle have given me $100,000 to run with, I'll try to figure out, well, how far did you try to vet your idea before you took these poor people's money? And do they understand that the odds of your failure, as much as they love you, are really yeah. super low? And, and um, you know, we, we really look at it as we, we believe you can take 
your team and your idea pretty far down the path for very low money to vet your idea and to establish something that gets close to product market fit before you go out for additional capital. And when you do that, one, it's more likely that you get capital. Two, you get to keep more of the company because you don't have to give as much away to raise capital because you're further down the road. And really the work that goes before that to get to that point is just legwork. It's, it's hard, but it's, it's hard only because it's active. It's not hard because it's rocket science. Right. And do you have a view? Cause you and I both hear from people who say, well, I don't know. I don't have a rich uncle. I don't know any of these folks. So I'm just going to crowdfund. Is that just a version of somebody coming to you and putting the money first? Yeah, I, I we see crowdfunding as a as a I mean, especially it depends on the product you have, right? If you have a service, you can't you know you can't really crowdfund it. Right. If you've got a consumer oriented product, it's easier to crowdfund because people can a broad you know a broad range of people can sort of get it in their head. If you're going after an enterprise, then eh, crowdfunding probably doesn't play very well. I mean, you might find a few people who like enterprise SaaS deals or something like that if you're you know if you're targeting that. Um, it, it's it's not a great place to raise a lot of money, and you're going to right away have a cap table that's divided into a lot of little sections, well put. Um, which. Right down the road, other serious investors aren't going to really like. So it's it's sort of a um, a last port of call. It doesn't mean hey, it's, you know, the money's green. If you're in the U.S., the money's all right. green. So <laughs> if you need it, go for it. Um, but it's not the first place I would go. And it's hard to raise real capital that way. It's very small dollars. Right. And, and so the, the cap table matters. Let's go to that. Will, are there things that you, uh, and I know you advise in the book, you and Raj have some thoughts um, around allocating equity. So let's stick on this cap table. What are the kind of things, and I do want people to read the book, but what are the kind of things that you would advise entrepreneurs who are listening to us now to think about if they are allocating capital among founders and also saying, um, I'm going to do that spreadsheet that you and I have both seen that... Um, really assumes 10 levels of financing and tells me how much I'm going to own at the end of it. <laughs> what do you tell them about cap tables and that exercise in, in, in futility, in my view? Oh, yeah. It, it, this, is a, th this may be one of the top reasons that startups fail, the, the <laughs> allocation of equity between founders. It's a, it's a killer. It trips up a lot of people. And by the way, if it's done well, um, it is a positive sign for people who will fund you. Like if 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 investors look at your cap table post, you know, pre-funding cap table and how you've divided equity among the founders and it's a logical, well thought out thing, it'll look positive because you've made some of the hardest decisions you make as a founding team already and you've shown that you can you can handle that stress. Um we we look at it. I mean, there's lots of ways to do it, but but we think that it's it's it. We we don't know how to take the stress out of it. We don't know how to take the pain <laughs> out of it. But yeah. what we we do believe is that um, there's too much thinking of the current time when equity is divided. And what you really want to do is put yourself out a couple of years looking back, if you can possibly do this, and you can say. Who has added what level of value to the company two years from now? So because you're not rewarding for now, you're rewarding for actually not two years, probably 10 years from now, because even if you're successful, exits don't generally happen for a decade. Something important to keep in mind, if you're cut out to be an entrepreneur, this is not a two-year run. This is a minimum of a 10-year run if you're successful in the first place. So um, if you look right away, it could be one of the team has the original idea. But as we talked about, ideas really aren't that important. And so sometimes we see companies, the, the founder that has the original idea, the gets the lion's share of the equity. And really, they're not going to, sometimes they're not going to be the person or the people who actually do the execution to make it 
super valuable. So that needs to be taken into account. The, the, the one thing we know that is a red flag and is a really bad signal is when you have a team of founders and you've just King solomon it. You know, you've basically taken the equity and <laughs> right. divided it by the number of people you have. Yeah. Never works. There is, you could, you could look this up. We have stories in the book about oh, it. I agree. Long yeah. list of, of founding teams who look back and say, oh my God, biggest mistake I made. What did I do? Yeah. Right. You, you can't divide evenly. People are in different situations. They, they, they will add different things to the company. Um, and you have to form the way ultimately the, the value add is for each of the founders. It's hard. We're not trying to make it sound simple. It's super hard. But you have to think to the future, not to the past. Yeah. And, and you and Raj do a great job. And, and I won't spoil it, but that's one of the main reasons to buy this book. Uh, because I think, um, well, what you did in the book is you tell it through stories. It's really hard to say, do these five things and you're good. Um, I think you learn uh, so many entrepreneurs and so many advisors and investors learn from these kind of challenges and these kind of mistakes. <clears throat> well, what about um, outside advisors, board members? Should they get a piece too? Mm. So um, I'm not a big fan of advisory boards. Let's start there. I, I think um, the advisory, advisory boards look great on paper. Um, you pull together some luminaries, some people with good advice. Maybe you give them a little stock. You don't give them cash generally. Um, and uh, they're very active for a short period of time. They, they peak and then they fall off. And it's just human nature. There's, there's no, nothing to keep them in the game. Um, the, the perceived value of the stock wanes very quickly. So they're not doing it for compensation after the initial hit. Um, and so a CEO or whoever, whomever is responsible for the, the board of advisors needs to be very active. You know, my, my, my view, my, uh, my sort of uh, draconian view of advisors is engage them, suck all the information you can out of them as quickly as you possibly can, and then move on to new advisors. Um, as an advisor myself, I love that idea. It's, I'm really going to be able to teach you, you know, 80% of everything I know in a relatively short period of time. You won't know it in detail. You won't have experience behind it, but you can get a lot of information pretty, pretty quickly. Now, boards of directors... Um, those people have skin in the game. They have a fiduciary responsibility that they that they uh, agree to, um, and if they have any experience, they understand. Um, those people are more tied for the long term, and um, you will compensate them more, but you'll get more out of them in the long term. I'm not saying you should have a big board of directors. Um, generally speaking, when you get financing, you're going to have to take more directors on. So you want to keep it good. Um, but we're huge proponents of bringing in a, uh, an independent, strong, in one single strong independent outside board member super early. In fact, before you get funding makes it a lot easier if they're, if they're good at what they do. Um, it's super valuable. They become the, the grease in the skids between the venture capitalists or the investors in general and the founding team. They become very close advisors and you can keep them almost as, almost as an operational part of your team. Um, we really like that model. And you can go to two if, if that makes sense, if, you're, if you've got that opportunity. Such great advice. And the distinction that you made between advisors and directors is something I emphasize with folks all the time. Uh, I think you're right that my own view is that the board of advisors works when you have kind of a specialty product where you want that credibility, maybe medical device or something like that. Um, but beyond it, I'm with you. You want folks who are, have skin in the game and can add credibility to, um, to, the, uh, to the entrepreneur's vision. Um, there's a whole piece in here, um, or you, you spend a lot of time, and it's, it's certainly, again, really important for entrepreneurs to read this part of the book. You start with, well, now you've got the capital. How do you scale? Um, without revealing too much in the book, because I want people to read it, Well, what would you tell folks, now that you've got the money, here's, here's some quick advice about scaling and the things you should be thinking about now that you have to scale. 
Well, scaling really is about, um, in, in technical products anyway, in IT products, software and, and other you know, consumer electronics and so forth, is, is, um, is really driven by people. Um, it's, uh, it's very difficult to scale if you don't have the fuel to do it, that is the capital to make it happen. And, uh, the, and you don't have the network to bring in all of the right people. So when you've gone from some initial success maybe some funding as part of that initial success, a little bit of good feedback on product market fit, um, then the scaling requires more people. And this is another place where startups often fail. Um, they start to bring on the second level of people. The founding team is tight, it's working together well, can have an argument and resolve the argument. Um, and then they bring in outside people and they're not able to either find them because they don't have the networks to do it, or hire the right people. And the opportunity cost in missing hiring the right people is huge because you bring on somebody, it takes you six, seven months to find out, to figure out that they're not the right person for the job. Now you're not only, not only don't have the right person and if you miss six to seven months of productivity, but now you gotta look for another person, which is gonna take months. So um, building that team is the most important part of, of scaling. You want an extension of the founding team, not overlap because you can't afford overlap. You want to extend the founding team, add more skills, add more networks, really critical, um, add more um, uh, difference in behavior and, um, and resilience to the team. By then you know the strengths and weaknesses of the team. Now you want to add to that instead of instead of just uh, um, uh, augmenting it. Mm, excellent, excellent advice. And Will, is there anything um, now that we're in the pandemic um, that you would say is kind of a gloss as a result of these unprecedented times that we're living through on the advice you've given? Has the pandemic changed any of the any of the advice in any way that you that you and Raj have uh, imparted to folks here? Uh, yes, and and the the book is pre pandemic, so um, this this unfortunately isn't covered. Um, well, I should say the magnitude of this isn't covered. Um, we think that um, uh, that hiring, because the team, in the end, we believe the team is going to make you successful or not. And obviously the culture you lay on top of the team. Um, hiring people um, without seeing them face to face, without getting their body language. I mean, you know, video is helpful, but it's not perfect at it. Um so hiring the right people, managing those people once once they're on board, bringing them up to speed, infinitely harder. I mean, a any study on uh, you know behavioral dynamics will will show you that you know communication drops to the square of the distance. It is it's just a it's just a monstrous right. problem, and you have to work extra hard to fill it. It's not to say it can't be done. Um, but you have to work at work extra hard to fill it. And that's the same with customers. If you have a direct sales model um, as part of your company, well, now it's really hard. You can't get on a plane. You can't go see the, the customer, um, you know, especially if you have, you know, face to face direct selling or you have application engineers that need to be on site to install and bring up bring up to speed. But even something earlier, like determining your marketing plan and product market fit. Um, you're, you're trying to get people to give you time online so you can understand if you've got the product that will meet their needs and something they'll pay for. All the remoteness adds a layer of difficulty that didn't exist before. All the process is the same. It just will take more time, more energy, more effort to make it, make it work well. Terrific. Will Herman, thank you so much. The book is The Startup Playbook. And, Will, you've got a website or two that you could direct people to for additional resources, don't you? Yeah, just go to startup-playbook.com. That's the source for everything. You can even download a free chapter to check it out. Excellent. Will, thanks for joining uh, Authors and Innovators and hope everyone enjoys this book. Thanks so much, Larry. Really appreciate the time.